To even have a basic fully aquatic whale in and of itself is a feat of engineering. I'm not saying intelligent design, I'm just saying engineering. What do you need? You need a countercurrent heat exchange because the testes are inside the body. You need a ball vertebra. Why? Because unlike a dog's tail that wags from side to side, you have to have a tail that moves up and down. You have to have the tail flukes. They're only found. They're not found in the protocedents. They're only found in the fully developed aquatic whales. You gotta have the muscular for it, musculature for it. You have to have the reorganization of kidney tissues. Why? Because you're not drinking fresh water. You have to intake salt water. You have to nurse young underwater. You have to modify the mammary glands uh, for that. The orientation of the fetus uh, of, for example, the protoces, the so-called intermediates, we know were like those of terrestrial mammals. However, in the case of, of whales, the orientation is reversed. It, you reduction of the hind limbs, forelimbs transformed into flippers, hydrodynamic properties of the skin, special lung surfactants. When whales dive and they, and they um, uh, come back to the surface, the lung has to re-expand and it has to dust, uh, do so very quickly. Novel muscle systems for the blowhole, modification of the eyes, modification of the teeth, and it's on and on. So what do you have? You have, in a short window of time, hundreds if not thousands of character state changes. Dramatic reorganization. Now my question is very specific. Can this geological pattern that I accept and that I'm not going to attribute to outside intervention of any form, can this geological pattern, this progression of forms, be explained by the processes of population genetics? And there, in other words, does neo-Darwinism and just neo-Darwinism provide an adequate causal explanation for the origin of these structures? Well, what is neo-Darwinian evolutionary theory? It's essentially that mutations generate variation. There are different kinds of mutations, different frequencies. Natural selection preserves the successful variance. And therefore, if new traits are necessary to produce a, a different biological form, depending upon the number of traits, then it's assumed that you have many adaptive mutations that had to arise and had to be preserved. All right? And how do you test this? Well, you can apply the equations of population genetics, and you can model them. You can get a textbook, and you can, you, it, it's, it's, it's done all the time. I brought some of the literature with me. And you can determine the plausibility, whether or not there were enough mutational resources available for a given scenario to work. In other words, you can ask, was there enough mutational grist for the mill of natural selection? Now, it's a numbers game. What do you need? You need three necessary factors. Many generations, that is to get a number of traits appearing, and you have to have many generations and or rapid mutation rates and or large population sizes. One more requirement, that it's not enough just to get a mutation. It's not enough for a gene variant to appear in a population. It's got to be fixed. It's got to go from that initial infinitesimal copy, the lone individual out there, to becoming the norm that's established. If you do not have these, then you have two possibilities. One is that variation becomes exhausted in a lineage. And you see this, for example, with endangered species um, or populations that suffer from what's called inbreeding depression. Or you can have that, but you also have what's called genetic drift, which, mean that, which means that you do not have the population sizes necessary for natural selection to be effective. And the population literally drifts. It's a random or nearly random process. So, I assert, and I'm only talking about neo-Darwinism and I'm not talking about anything else, I assert that there are three problems and they're readily identifiable. One is that there were too few generations involved in the transition, I'll explain why. One is that the adaptive mutation rates, known adaptive mutation rates, are far too low. And the third is that mammalian population sizes are far too small. Now let's look first at adaptive mutations. I drew the, uh, how I calculated this on a board, so should there be any questions, I'll, I'll be happy to walk you through it. What I calculated here, given a known rate of an adaptive mutation, this is a mutation that appears and doesn't just affect a trait slightly in a positive way, but it affects a number of traits and in a positive way. And we know these from organisms that we can study well. Bacteria, viruses, and um, fungi, like, like yeast. 
And what I did is I took three breeding population sizes. These, think in your mind, these are walking whales I'm talking about. And all that matters are the individuals that reproduce. The rest uh, uh, you don't factor in. And I plugged in how long it would take for one adaptive mutation to appear in a population. What population size would you need? And what we can do, very simply, is we can rule out two of them. And here's why. If you assume that, say, these walking whale populations were the same size that uh, we know of some very large animals, uh, large mammals, for example, say 10,000 breeding individuals per generation, five years per generation, then we know, well, you can readily calculate, it would take around 136 million years for that to appear. But guess what? You have nine. And in case for many of the trait changes, you have far less than that. If you assume a breeding population of a mil million individuals, you run into a problem, and here's why. With mammals, breeding population sizes are in the tens of thousands to the hundreds of thousands. House mouse. House mice exist in millions if not billions of individuals globally. And they're breeding and they're doing their business underground. But here's the thing. The breeding population size of the house mouse is around 600,000 individuals. It's between 410,000 and roughly uh, 800,000. In our case, uh, hominids, until very recently, the breeding population size was around 20,000 individuals per generation. So numbers matter. But he, so let's put that aside. But what if you needed multiple coordinated changes to affect the transitions that I've illustrated? Here going from protoceded, Georgia cetus, to Adorodon, actually Basilosaurus. Well, let me give you an example of one. What, this is a cetacean countercurrent heat exchange system. Cetacea have their testes on the inside of the body, right next to the muscles that generate heat during swimming. Now, what happens in mammals is that if the testes are in the inside of the body and they're not cooled, you have sterility. So you have to cool down the glands. And this is done. Uh, in G similar to a modern refrigeration system by shunning cool blood from the tail flukes to a, a, a plexus or nexus, if you will, of arteries and veins that dissipates the heat from the gland. So even though a cetacean is, is moving in the water column, the testes are remaining below core body temperature. Now, let's assume, and I think this is an absurd assumption, that only two mutations were necessary for this complex adaptation that I've just shown. We can assume that it was far simpler than that. It doesn't matter. Yeah, coordinated mutations. Durrett and Schmidt, 2008, have an interesting paper in genetics, and they were attempting to refute Michael Behe's uh, book, uh, The Edge of Evolution. And they calculated the probability of getting two coordinated mutations, very simple mutations, not in a protein coding gene, but just in some DNA sequence that, uh, say, would uh, bind a factor. Well, the probability and, you know, in various population sizes. And their conclusion was is that, well, you could get these two coordinated mutations in the human lineage. You've only got 20,000 individuals on average per generation, once every 216 million years. Now, if you factor in that the human chimp divergence was five and a half million years, um, it seems that it's rather unlikely. For walking whales, if you adjust the equation to say, well, you're dealing with more individuals, that adds up to around 43.3 million years. That's just uh, the paper and the calculations they used to come up with that conclusion. So here's the nub of the issue, and the only issue I'm, I'm here to discuss tonight. If the evolutionary process, and by that I've defined it as neo-Darwinian theory, would typically produce only two coordinated coordinated mutations in 216 million years in a hominid lineage, and if in these aquatic mammal precursors, these whales, the evolutionary process would have only produced two such mutations in 43 million years, how could this process alone have produced fully aquatic cetaceans with their multiple anatomical novelties requiring many hundreds even thousands of adaptive changes in less than two million years, even less than nine million years, perhaps even 50 million years. 